Turn to Matthew, if you will. The ninth chapter. Be praying for me. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a short sermon. As I said before, I, I don't like two types of sermons. I don't like... Uh, I don't like to be hemmed in with sermons like when it's Christmas or Mother's Day or Father's Day where you have to preach a certain type of a sermon. And I also don't like short sermons. And uh, I usually, most of you know, I usually preach... Oh, I'll turn the mic on. That's it. All right, now the mic's on. And I usually preach about 45 minutes, but uh, I'm going to do the best I can with this sermon. I'm going to try to make the points and pray that God will touch people's hearts. Because we do have a, ba a baptism this morning. Then tonight we're going to have a big baptism. So all of you that uh, are going to be baptized, you be sure and come back tonight. And if there are those that are here this morning that don't know Jesus as their Savior, we're going to invite you to come forward and accept Him as your Savior, and, and, and we'll baptize you too. So we want you to know that this church is open. The whole purpose of this church is to win souls. And I tell you what, I don't believe I can go to a church if their main primary goal isn't to win in souls. I love to win souls to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason I do is because we have a wonderful Savior. More than wonderful, as she's saying. More than wonderful. And the more I study the Bible, the more I'm amazed at just how wonderful He is. And I would like to touch on this morning just how wonderful Jesus is. And I would like to touch on his ability. Now, the ninth chapter of Matthew, the 27th verse. I'll begin reading with the 27th verse. And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was coming to the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were open. Now notice what happened. The two blind men had no doubt heard about Jesus. We know that they hadn't seen the miracles because they were blind, but nevertheless they had known Either they had heard or they had been in the area and they knew that this man called Jesus could work miracles. And no doubt these men that were blind had gone everywhere and had done everything and was at the end of their rope. And they knew that the only hope they had was that if they could get to this man called Jesus and if this man called Jesus would have mercy on them. Now notice the question that he asked. Then saith he unto them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? Now it isn't a question, is he able? That doesn't even come into play. We know that he's able. We know that he is more than able. And how do we know that? Because the Bible says that all power is given unto him in heaven and earth. He has the power. That isn't the question. And it isn't even the question, is he willing? Because we know that he's always willing. But the question is, do you believe that he's able to do this? Now here's the point. We know that Jesus is able to save. We know that. But do you believe that he's able to save in your particular case? That's the question. Now we know that he is able. Now, he performed many miracles and the reason he performed those miracles was to prove that he had the power to do what he said he could do and also to confirm that he was who he said he was. He said, I am the Son of God. I am the Anointed One. I am the one that the Father anointed to be the Savior of the world and he worked those miracles to prove that he has the power to save you. See, I wouldn't put a lot of confidence if someone just walked up and says, I'm the Savior. Well, how do we know that? Well, just take my word for it. No. He backed it up with miracles. Now, one of the miracles that he worked, he had been teaching the people and Jesus and the disciples got in a little ship and they started across the sea and he was tired and he went to sleep in the back of the ship. And they were rowing, and while he was asleep, 
suddenly a storm come upon them. A big storm came upon them. And the storm was so fierce, it says that the waves covered the ship. In other words, the ship was filling with water to the point that the disciples, the apostles, were afraid they were going to drown. Now, I want to tell you something. The storm came on them suddenly. And do you realize that storms come in our life and usually when they come, it's suddenly. Boy, we get bad news and it's suddenly. Something will happen to us and it's suddenly. And they were rolling along. It was a calm day and suddenly the storm hit. And they were almost, or at least they thought, at the point of perishing. And they woke him up and said, Lord, care not that we perish. And he stood up and said, Oh, ye of little faith. You know, I would like to have been there. I wish they'd had video cameras back there and someone could have taken a picture of that. Can you imagine that raging storm in the ship as it was filling with water and it would sink down and rise up on the waves? And there's Jesus standing there and says, Peace be still. He rebuked the wind and the wind just quit. And you know what it says? There was a great calm. Now listen, son, let me tell you something. He didn't just restore the sea back to its former state. There was a great calm. You know, one time in my life, and I'll never forget this, and I've been out around farm ponds and puddles of water, and there's days when the wind's not blowing, and it'd be like a, just like glass. And we've all seen that happen. But when I was around 19 or 20 years old, I was down at Fort Gibson, big lake. And I woke up one morning, and I looked out there. In fact, we went out on the boat, and that whole lake was just like glass. A great calm. I want to tell you something. Jesus is able. I don't care what kind of storm you've got in your life. I don't care what kind of problems you've got in your life. I want to tell you something. Jesus calmed the storms to prove that he can master any situation that you might be going through. It isn't a question, is he able? It's a question, do you believe that he is able? He's able. We have an able Savior. A great Savior. There was another time when he was teaching and the multitudes had followed him out in the wilderness and that no long, I don't know how long he'd been fe- uh, teaching, but the people were hungry and, and the disciples said, Jesus, send them away now so that they can go get something to eat. But he says, no, they've been here too long. He says, they will faint on the way back. In other words, they, uh, they need something to eat now. And the disciples said, well, Lord, we just have a little bit of money. Well, we couldn't buy enough. With what money we got, we couldn't buy enough food to give everyone just a little taste. And he says, did anybody bring any food? And he said, well, a little boy did. He said, he brought a few little fish and a few little loaves. He said, go get them. Boy, there's a good lesson in this. And he took the fish and the loaves. And you know what? It's amazing at what ease the Savior works miracles. It says that he just broke the bread and broke the fish. He just kept breaking it and kept breaking it. And there were 5,000 men there, not counting the women and children, so there were probably somewhere around 12,000 people there that day. And when he got through feeding the multitudes, they took up the fragment, and there was 12 basketfuls left over. Just calmly working the miracles. Why? Because he's able. He has the power. You know, once in a while I'll turn on the television and I'll see these faith healers. And did you ever notice what they do? You know, it seems like to me they exert an awful lot of effort. effort. You know what I mean? Boy, they'll hit somebody on the forehead and it might cure their arthritis, but now they've got brain concussion. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But he did, he'd just speak a word and there's healed. He'd just break the fish and feed the multitudes. He would just say, peace be still, and the storms would calm. Listen, I want to tell you something. Jesus fed the multitudes. You know what that tells me? There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. There's room at the cross for you. You know, I don't care if the whole world had been assembled there that day. I believe Jesus could have just continued to break and feed. He's able. He's able. I don't care what kind of a need you're having in your life. Jesus is more than able to satisfy. And then he proves something out without a shadow of a doubt. You know, so many times we think of eternal life as being a thing. How many think, how many, how many times do we speak of eternal life as an inanimate thing? How many believe eternal life is a thing? 
No. Eternal life is a person. You see, eternal life came down from the Father and took on the form of human flesh and dwelt among us. Turn, if you will, to the book of St. John. Let me show you something that happened in the book of St. John. Jesus had a friend named Lazarus. Lazarus was sick. And they got, got uh, word to, to Jesus. They said, your friend Lazarus is sick. Now Jesus stayed four more days where he was before he left to go to Lazarus. And on the way to Lazarus, the disciples were concerned about their friend Lazarus and Jesus said, Lazarus is asleep. And they said, well, that's good. If Lazarus is asleep, that means that the fever's broke and he's doing better. Jesus said, no, you don't understand. Jesus is dead. And he said, the reason I didn't go four days ago is for your sake. Now, just before he got there, in the 11th chapter of St. John, 18th verse, Now, Bethany was nine to Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and to Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary sat still in the house. Now notice, look, look, what, look what Martha said. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. Now, you know what? That's just a common thing that we would probably all have thought. In other words, Lord, we know you've got power, and we know that you've got enough power that you could have kept him from dying. But it's too late. It's too late. You know, it's amazing how we limit God. It's too late. If you'd have been here four days ago, Everything had been fine. But Lord, now it's too late. We know that God saves little children. But you see, I'm 50 years old or more and I, I've never been saved and I'm hardened in sin and it's too late. Too late. But look what Jesus said. And Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Now Martha still didn't understand Martha said to him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Look what Jesus said. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? I want to tell you who's going to heaven. I'll tell you exactly who it is that's going to heaven. It's those that believe it that Jesus is the resurrection and the life and those that believe it in him shall never die. See, we're saved by grace through faith. Jesus said it, I believe it, and I know that he's able to bring it to pass. He said, I am the resurrection. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine Jesus walking into your presence and there you behold eternal life in human form? There is the resurrection in all of his glory and all of his power. And he said, where did you lay? Boy, I want to tell you, our problems are just his opportunity. Did you know that? Now, now notice something. It goes on to say that, oh, they were weeping naturally. He said, where did you lay? He said, I want to see. And as they took him, the people said, oh, it's too late. It's too late. He can't do it. It's too late. He can't do anything. And, Je and the Bible says that Jesus groaned in his spirit and then he wept. You know why he wept? I'll tell you why I believe he wept. A lot of people say, well, Jesus wept because he loved Lazarus. Well, I know he loved Lazarus. But listen, he knew he was going to raise Lazarus. He wept because of their unbelief. And I believe he still weeps because people will not come to him that they might have life. He said, where did you lay him? And they said, well, it's too late. He said, Lord, he died four days ago. He's been in the grave four days. It's too late. If you'd have been here right after he died, maybe, you know. But Lord, he's been dead four days. It's too late. He said, where did you lay him? I am the resurrection and the life. And he walked up and he told me, he said, roll that stone back. You know what I believe? I believe God wants you to do what you can do and he'll do what you can't do he said roll the stone back 
they rolled the stone back and he said, Lazarus, come forth. And it says that Lazarus come out of that tomb wrapped in grave cloths with a napkin about his face. And you know what Jesus said then? Hey, he already proved he's the resurrection and the life. He said, I'm able. I don't care if they've been dead four days or 4,000 years. He says, I am able to raise them up. Why? Because he's the resurrection and the life. And then he told him, he said, take the grave claws off of him. See, now we can do that, can't we? We can remove the grave. We can't raise the dead, but we can sure take the grave claws off. And I want to tell you something. Every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, every Sunday morning in Sunday school, the teachers and the preachers are here to take the grave claws off. That's what we're doing. Do you see, the more you know about the Bible, the freer you are. The, 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 Jesus said, I will, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You know, it's amazing how many Christians that, that, that's driving up and down the road, they're still bound in grave cloths. They don't know what belongs to them. They're crippled. They're hampered. They don't know that Jesus saves them. They don't know that Jesus keeps them. They don't know that Jesus loves them. They don't know these things. And it's our job to remove the grave cloths. We teach the Word of God because I'm going to tell you something. What you don't know will hurt you. It will hinder you. And, and, the th- and my payday is when I teach and I see light bulbs go off. I see people go, oh. it, You know, and, and just about every time we have a study, somebody will say, Boy, I didn't know that. Boy, I'm glad to find that out. I'm glad you brought that out. See, that's removing the grave cause that holds us. That's getting rid of the old life. Jesus is the resurrection. Now, listen, I'm going to tell you something. There's no problem with him saving you. No problem. He said, I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. You say, yes, but I'm a great sinner. Jerry, you don't know what I've done. I don't care what you've done. He come to seek and to save that which is lost. The bigger the sinner, the better the candidate. He said, I didn't come to save good people. I come to save sinners. And he's able. And he worked miracles after miracles after miracles. And John said, if all the things that Christ had done had been written in books, he said, I don't suppose the world could contain those books. Constantly proving that he's the Christ, he's the only one, and that he's able to save to the uttermost. Now, I want to show you something that he said. He said that. Turn back to Matthew, if you will. And I'll try to wrap this up. And when he was coming to the house, the blind men came to him and said, Jesus saith unto them, and and Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then test he their eyes, saying, and this is important, According to your faith, be it unto you. According to your faith, be it unto you. Do you know what some people, I'll tell you, some people just jump in with both feet. I like to see people that just jump in both feet, and I mean they just trust him with everything they am, they are and everything they've got. They just trust him all the way. But some people are skeptical, you know. And, and I'm not saying they're not saved. Listen, all you have to do is touch the hem of his garment and he'll save you. But a lot of people don't have any peace. See, it's kind of like, well, I know, I know he's saved me, but I, I don't think he can keep me. See? Listen, your faith is dependent... I mean, your, your peace is dependent upon how much faith you have. Listen, I believe in a God that not only can save me, but can keep me. And I have peace about the thing. I have peace. But you know, a lot of times we're like the little woman, you know, that, that, that she, she had an infirmity 12 years, crippled 12 years. And there Jesus was going down the street and he was healing people. And she thought, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. That's all I have. Boy, that's faith, isn't it? She, she didn't say, if I could get his attention, undivided attention, and tell him what all's wrong with me. Listen, God already knows what all's wrong with you. Did you know that? He already knows what all. He knows things wrong with you. He knows wrong with you. He's the great physician. He diagnoses the case. But she said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I know that I'd be healed. So here Jesus is going along, and, and he was in a great multitude of people. They were pressing him. You know, people, it's kind of like going to the fair. How many is going to the fair? 
And, you know, and notice more people, just, you're just going down through like this. You don't see anything, you know. You just kind of shuffle along the crowd. That's kind of the way he was. And she reached and just touched his garment. <laughs> Immediately she was healed. And Jesus stopped and said, somebody touch me. Now, can you imagine the, the, the surprise on the disciple? What do you mean somebody touched you? I mean, here you are in a mob of people. They're all just kind of pushing you along. <laughs> you know, you say, somebody touched He said, no, I felt virtue go out of me. And boy, then that scared that poor woman to death. And when she was found out, when she realized they knew who touched him, it says she fell at his feet trembling. And you know, a lot of people think that, that, that God will save them, but he's re very reluctant about it. He doesn't really want to. You know, I, it's like i got to steal the blessing. And she trembles at, oh, Lord, listen, I, I, you know, oh, she was scared to death. And she said, I did it. I, I touched the hem of your, of your garment. Because, and the reason I did it, because I've been sick for 12 years, and as soon as I touched you, I was made whole. See, she was afraid that he would remove the blessing. I want to tell you something. If God ever blesses you, he don't take it back. And Jesus turned and said, peace be unto you. In other words, bless you, lady. Don't you worry about it, lady. You had faith to touch me. And you got the miracle. Isn't that great? What a Savior. She just touched the hem of his garment. But see, a lot of people are saved, but they're scared to death. They don't realize how much he loves them. They don't know that it honors Christ when you trust him and believe him. Boy, I'll tell you what. I have to trust him and I have to believe him all the time because I know how I am. And if you want to talk to my wife, she'll tell you how I am. I'm a long ways from perfect, but I've got a perfect Savior. But notice what happened after he touched their eyes. He said their eyes were open. Do you know what? Jesus never leaves a situation like he found it. If he goes to a wedding, he'll turn water into wine. If he's in a storm, he'll calm the storm. If he's around lepers, he'll heal them. Now, here's the point I'm trying to make. When Jesus saves you, he's going to change you. He's not going to leave you like you are. See, now you stop and think about it. These blind men came in there with sightless eyes, staring into space, and he says, he touched their eyes. Now, wouldn't it have been something if he said, you're healed? And there they go back out just like this, see? Listen, they didn't go out like they came in, friend. And when you get saved, you're not going to go out like you came in either. If you go out like you came in, you didn't get it. You didn't touch him by faith because Jesus does a miracle on you. He changes you. It's called a regeneration. It's the new birth. He makes a new creature out of you. And I heard a preacher say the other day, and I believe it, he said, our churches are full of lost people. Our churches are full of people that have never been saved. There's no holiness in their life. There's no change. You see, they come, they've joined the church, they've been baptized, they've done all those things, but they're still living ungodly lives. There's no change. But Jesus changes you. I've heard people say, I'd like to be saved, but I don't think I can live it. Well, I want to tell you something. I'll tell you right now, you can't. You can't. If you could, could he wouldn't need to give you the new birth. You stop and think about it. If you could live it, you wouldn't need to become a new creature in Christ Jesus. If you could live it, live it, he wouldn't need to fill you with his Holy Spirit. See? He changes you. Now notice something else, and I'll close with this. The blind men made no effort to help him. They didn't come with their eyes set and say, well, I think, I, Lord, I couldn't, before you start, I could rub a little this on you. Think that helped? No. No. They knew the case was hopeless. They knew their only hope was in Jesus. And all they did was come and stand and let Jesus work the miracle. You know, I believe a lot of people would be saved if they think they've got to do it. You don't do nothing. You just believe that he's able and submit yourself to the great position and he'll work the miracle. He'll change your life. He'll change your desires and your want-tos. And then the church will do all we can to take the grave claws off and set you free that you might live in fullness and in life. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, we want you to come this morning and say, I, by faith, 
I by faith know that he's able. And I submit myself this morning to the great physician. I want this salvation. Then you come. It's by faith. He said it's according to your faith. If you don't have any faith, you don't get the miracle. But if you believe that Jesus is able, and if you say, I believe it, you say, I believe it. I believe he's able and I believe he's willing. Then by faith, just present yourself to him. It's so easy to be saved. It's amazing how easy it is to be saved. I tell you what, it's as easy to be saved as it is just reaching out and receiving something. Jesus says, just accept eternal life. And you just take it by faith. Now let me show you something else. Okay. Go ahead. Well, it, well, you know, he's got a lot of faith in me. But do you see, he's not going to reach out and take it unless he believes I'm going to give it. See? Now, a lot of people sit there and say, boy, I'd like to be saved, but I don't think he's going to save me. Well, he won't. But if by faith you said, yes, I believe in Jesus. I believe he's able, and I'm coming this morning, and I'm trusting him as my Savior. I guarantee you, you will not go home disappointed. You will, Because he wants, to, he wants to save you more than you want to be saved. Maybe you've had problems in your life. Maybe you're going through a storm and that storm needs to be calmed. Listen, I want to tell you, the same, the same great physician takes care of all cases. Did you know that? Whether supplying your needs, start, uh, uh, calming the storms, raising the dead, whatever it is, he's able. He knows your case. He knows exactly what to do in your case. Let's stay. Let's stay. If Jesus is speaking to you this morning, won't you come? Maybe you say, Jerry, I am saved, and, and, but I'm, I'd like to become a member of this church. Then won't you come? Whatever God is speaking to you about, won't you come? Or you say, Jerry, I'm not saved, but I still don't understand what it is I need to do. Will you come? We'll show you. It's simple. We'll show you what you need to do to be saved. But if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, won't you come? Won't you come? If you want a brand new life, a brand new start, won't you come as we sing?